This episode is brought to you by Roundtable Group, the experts on experts. We've been connecting attorneys with experts for over 25 years. Find out more at roundtablegroup.com. Welcome to Discussions at the Roundtable. I'm your host, Noah Balmer. And today's guest is Donald Parent, the owner of Parent Technology Group, which specializes in the design and manufacture of electrical products and automated process machines. He's a licensed professional engineer and experienced expert witness with over three decades of experience and over two dozen U.S. and international patents. Mr. Parent holds a master's in mechanical engineering from Stanford. Mr. Parent, thank you so much for joining me here today at the roundtable. Hello, no, nice to be here with you. Absolutely. Let's jump into it. You have been a professional engineer for over 30 years. How did you get started and how did you first become an expert witness? Huh. Well, I have to confess first that it's probably more approaching 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> but my path to becoming an expert witness is a little circuitous and opportunistic. Uh, first of all, I didn't start off going to college. What I decided, what I did do is I went to vocational school after call after high school, and uh, I learned how to be a machinist. And I worked in a machine shop, and I thought, huh, it'd be interesting to go to college, and maybe I could be a mechanical engineer, whatever that is. And uh, the next thing I knew, I was in Boston going to, going to college, and. I have to say that I just found my passion when I was there. You know, in the first classes, I remember the first uh, calculus classes realizing, wow, you can do this. This is amazing. Got into gear. It did very well academically. Uh, I graduated summa cum laude from uh, Northeastern and was hired by Bell Labs, but I had applied at a number of different graduate schools. Uh, Bell Labs decided they would pay for me to go to grad school at Stanford. And so therefore, that's where I went. My focus was in the thermosciences, the study of heat transfer, fluid mechanics, thermodynamics, things like that. And one of the things that was required also is to have a breath area. And because I was working at Bell Labs, I chose electrical engineering. And I spent a lot of time in electrical engineering classes, taking power power circuits and uh, controls and computer hardware construction and all that kind of stuff. That has proven to have been a real net positive for me uh, in the area of being an expert witness. I worked at Bell Labs for a while. There was a divestiture that occur, occurred. AT&T divested itself of its baby bells. And uh, the next thing I knew, my job was fairly uncertain there in terms of where it was going to go. So I decided to move back north. Uh, I'm from Maine originally. So I started moving back north. I went to work at GTE, where I designed uh, components for automobiles. Uh, I worked on the first heater system for the GM EV1 electric car, for example. And I was at that company, GTE, for a few years. And there was another opportunity that emerged to be a vice president of engineering for a small entrepreneurial company in Portland, Maine, I took that job. And that was great because we w worked on high voltage devices for eliminating static from plastic parts. That was a great, uh, great experience, great opportunity, worked there for seven years. Then another thing happened, and that is Compact Disc. And there was a startup company in Southern Maine that was designing and building equipment for making CDs. So I was hired by them. And that company grew like a weed. We developed uh, high-speed equipment for making CDs and DVDs that were sold all over the world, many in Japan, many in Europe and South America. That brought me into the world of high-speed automation, vacuum systems, controls, the things that I really love. I did that for seven years, and uh, that company was sold. So I started my own company with the goal of taking some of the processes that we developed for making CDs and DVDs. By the way, I have a couple of patents on the process of manufacturing uh, DVDs. I, I should say that I worked with Gillette on the uh, packaging for the uh, Mach 3 shaver. And if you look at the original Mach 3 shaver, it has a reflective insert in the package. It's a metalized insert. And the reason Gillette did that was because metalized things at the time were all the rage because of CDs. Uh, so I worked with them on that. 
And I also worked on a piece of equipment to make metallized plastic cutlery. Well, I developed the product and I also developed the machinery to make the product, which interfaces with injection molding machines uh, to make those things at a very high rate of speed. That led to, hey, what do we do next with this? And one logical thing was cosmetic products. We sold six machines to a company in Europe uh, that installed three of them in Italy and three of them in France. And uh, that company was sold off. And then I needed a job. Reached out to people that I went to grad school with who are in the business. And they sort of bootstrapped me into the expert witness business. And here I am talking to you today. You were looking to be an expert witness. You decided, hey, this is something that I could do. I have I have expertise. I could be an expert witness. And uh, you received your very first call. And how did that go? What did you learn? What surprised you? And how has that changed throughout your career? Probably the first call was um, a door stamping press in Chicago. This thing was a big, heavy-duty machine stamping out steel doors, basically. They were having a tremendous problem with failure. So this was not a litigation case. Well, it would probably have turned into that, I suppose, if it didn't get fixed. Why is this thing failing all the time? Well, I was able to you know, recommend a solution. I don't know if it ever got implemented. But my point is that with a broad background with depth in various areas, your mechanical engineering education can take you a long ways, and you can apply it to a lot of things relatively easily. Well, let me ask you, how important is it that not only you have expertise, but that you continue to learn, that you keep up on that expertise? What does it mean to continue to be an expert? Yeah, I, and I am a major believer in continuing education for sure, fundamentally. So one of the things that the expert witness business does for a person, I think, if you're at all inquisitive at all, you know, in any way, especially as it relates to complex cases, if you are working on a complex case where you may have to interact with other engineers who have other areas of specialization, you get to learn about what those other people do. You get to oversee that work. You get to basically follow their reasoning, follow their train of thought. And uh, that in and of itself, if you want to be a student of what's going on, you can learn a lot about material science. You can learn a lot about engineering mechanics. There's a lot of opportunity to learn just in doing your job. But that's not to negate the need for continuing education. Keep yourself current. Uh, things are changing all the time and you need to stay current. It's an interesting point you bring up working with other expert witnesses. Uh, what is that team dynamic like? Do you work with them on all parts? In other words, do you collaborate on something like an expert report? Or do you all kind of have your individual areas with just minimal uh, collaboration? Well, it's almost all of the above. But let me describe what, A, what I like best and what seems to happen most frequently. In various cases, I work on fire and explosion cases, failure cases, accidents, and IP-related cases. The first three, accidents, fires and explosions, and failures, you can categorize them separately, but very often they're intertwined. For example, I guess you could say a failure can result in an explosion, or an explosion can cause a failure that can cause an accident. So you can see how some of these things can go around and around, like an, an accident can result in a fire. I work in all three, but I am not a fire investigator, for example. So I will work with a fire investigator. I'll work with an individual, for example, that has a specialized knowledge in fire engineering and who knows how to make combustion calculations and things like that. Um, so that would be one type of person. Electrical engineers who have a particular specialization in an area that I deal, don't really know a lot about. But with my background in electrical engineering, I can talk the talk. And in working with that individual, I can learn a lot more about their train of thinking and about how that all fits together with everything. So it is collaborative without any question. In any sort of collaborative case, there's the risk for excessive overlap. There's always going to be a little overlap in what people do, but there's a risk of 
doubling up on things when you shouldn't have to. Typically, I find that one person sort of ends up in the lead in terms of coordinating the work that needs to get done. And because of the, the breadth aspect of what I've done, I tend to be the person that does that. And I don't mind doing that at all. I don't mind. One other specialization that I want to emphasize is really important is scene graphics, case graphics that you might incorporate later in a case. Uh, that's very important because for a lot of very complex cases, many of those have fires or explosions. The evidence is largely gone, substantially destroyed. And we often depend upon the person who is doing the scene investigation to, to actually recreate the scene graphic. And what we find is that once that is done, that becomes the focal point for the work that we have to do. We all work using that as if that is the evidence that we have looked at because it's a good point of reference for us all. That's a really interesting point regarding the uh, person or people who are doing scene graphics. Is that something that you collaborate with in the development of those graphics? Is that uh, you know something that comes up very frequently in a lot of the cases that you work on? I, I haven't uh, talked a lot about that yet. Well, in, that's great. Great question. In this one individual that I work with relatively frequently, he has been doing this type of work for 20 some odd years, maybe even longer. So he knows the business. He knows scene reconstruction very well. So he is part of the initial investigation almost every single time. He knows enough that he knows what he's looking for. But we do work together in the area of the technical areas that we need to analyze. I'll give you an example. We once worked on a um, a roof failure case, a large uh, commercial warehouse roof failure case where there was leaking and all sorts of stuff. Uh, there needed to be some thermal analysis of the heat transfer that goes on at the joints between the relative pieces that are on the roof. And I had to work, he basically drew up the overall site, but in the area where we suspected the issue occurred, he and I had to work closely together so that he properly represented the work that we had done, that we knew we needed to analyze. Now, here's where it becomes really advantageous. I didn't even mention this earlier, but one of the things that we needed to do was to do a thermal finite element analysis of that joint, given the weather patterns that had happened uh, over the period that led to the leaking. The graphics that he had developed were used as input into the finite element program. So it's actually a time saver. It, it, I say a time saver. It eliminates the need of a secondary person creating that kind of stuff. It's part of the reconstruction of the building. But then later on, as you said, getting back to what you were saying earlier, Noah, those same graphics can then be used for testimony, for what have you. You know, So it, it gets used at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end. How's that? Absolutely. Be, yeah. be, besides the uh, the collaborative efforts between you and the experts and the scene graphicists, um, what is the collaboration like between you and your team? And the attorney themselves, are you what makes what makes a great team? What makes a great attorney expert witness relationship in general? It's nice to like to work with each other. <laughs> that that helps. But typically I have found that every attorney that I've worked with, we almost immediately have had a good working relationship. And the reason for that is because number one, I find attorneys to be inquisitive and intelligent and like to learn. Engineers are the same way, but we have complementary skill sets. So I can learn about the law from an attorney and an attorney can learn about engineering from the engineering guy. And I have found that what that does is it creates a very positive feedback loop where we can learn from each other and we can move things forward. Let's pivot to some of the more mechanical aspects of expert witnessing. Have you done a significant amount of work for both the plaintiff and the defendant side? Yeah, I did look at that. I think it might be like 40 plaintiff, 60 uh, defense, something like that. 
Would you say that there's any market difference between the two in terms of being an expert witness and writing reports? I haven't personally found any huge differences other than, uh, you know, sometimes the attorney the def- on the defense side will withhold my report uh, until they get the report from the plaintiff. And this is all part of the legal machinations that go on behind the scene, which I'm not necessarily privy to, but I know occurs. Sure. Um, but, uh, maybe one area that's different is billing on the plaintiff side can be a little convoluted. Oh, how so? Well, uh, frequently what will happen, let me make sure I do this right here or or, or on the defense side. Typically, if the insurance company is involved, the attorneys will submit the bill to the insurance company and it goes through the insurance company system and typically it takes a long time to be processed. And so that's one thing that, and to be fair, I have to change, I have to change what I said earlier. I have found that then on the defense side, sometimes it takes longer to get paid because the insurance companies are involved on the plaintiff side. Um, the cash, cash flow loop is shorter, and so the cash comes in more quickly. Well, that makes sense. When you're on the stand or you're in a deposition, you're in front of people who are peppering you with questions. Tell me a little bit about maintaining your demeanor, about how you approach things like levity. Do you throw the occasional joke in? or How, how would you describe your, in me, your demeanor in uh, the face of uh, potentially intense questioning, whether in front of a deposition or a jury trial? The first time I was deposed, as an expert witness, not as a fact witness, but as an expert witness. It was in Los Angeles. It was a compact disc piracy case. And it was probably the first time I was experiencing uh, a deposition. When I was getting cross-examined, the the attorney was great and he was very cordial. What I didn't realize is he was leading me down a path to ask a question that he knew I would have a very difficult time answering. And I did not expect that at all. I did okay. I think I did okay with it. It's all history now. It was a long time ago. But it taught me a lesson about the fact that we're not sitting here. It's not fun and games here. Be serious and and try to see how the flow of information is proceeding. And uh, typically, when that type of thing occurs, I can kind of see it coming because I know where the areas of weakness they may be going after. To me, it's come down to confidence in the work that you have done. If you feel like you've done good work and your work is objective and truthful and solid, it's not a big deal. It's just not a big deal. It's not contentious. It's just about exchanging information. That's all it is. Is there anything that you find attorneys can do to help prepare their expert witnesses for situations like that that can be on the tent side, especially for newer expert witnesses? Well, I was really kind of surprised, again, going back to that first initial case, that apparently in some areas, attorneys are not allowed to prepare their expert witnesses because I was not allowed, because I had asked the attorney a few questions about how things would proceed, and he told me that he couldn't tell me, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. But I guess in in other venues, it hasn't been a problem. So, um, again, it's all the nuances of each individual locale, I guess. Uh, But in terms of how I can be prepared, I suppose that, uh, to be fair, that hasn't happened that often. Sure, maybe something that comes with with experience. You just become accustomed to those kinds of questions and you expect it, which can relax you a little bit. Yeah, you know, one interesting experience was to go through a voir dire. That was interesting. That happened one time. And the unusual thing about it was it occurred during the height of COVID. So it was on Zoom. And the fact is that everybody looked the same. And everybody was in dressed like I am today. <laughs> uh, it was pretty, that judge included. Everybody was the same. And so the thing that was really interesting about that was that it was difficult to remember who has which role. At this time, you know, they're just because I didn't know any of these people. Sure. So that was interesting. It went well. I prevailed. I was in, and that's it. And the interesting thing that came about, by the way, I should say, is one of the issues relative to Davo Adir was that this is a case, again, I think this was 
Yeah, this case revolved around a free thaw case that was linked to weather events. Again, we did a thermal finite element analysis on a, on a, on a brick and cement structure that had frozen. The contention on the other side was, well, this person is the wrong person to be testifying because the person needs to be a meteorologist because it is linked to weather patterns because it got cold, it got warm and all that, which is wrong because the issue is not about the weather. The weather is simply varying temperatures that you can download from the National Weather Service. What really is at play is what happened in this brick and concrete structure. That is solely a mechanical engineering problem. It was relatively easy to explain how I went about the work that I did, how I used the data that I obtained from the National Weather Service, why that data was accurate, and whatever else. There was no problem, and I I, I prevailed in that one. Let's talk a little bit about the role of expert witnesses. As you know, it is the job of the attorney to best represent their client, but it is the job of the expert witnesses to best represent the truth. Tell me a little bit about your understanding of neutrality and the importance of neutrality for expert witnesses. It's very important. Absolutely. Right. I say you follow the evidence, you apply the science, and you derive an answer from that in the best possible way that you can. From that, you get your, you'll, you get a conclusion. And I have found that it's been, I don't think it is, there has been a single time when I have been pressured in any way to provide a response that would be more advantageous to the case or not. Typically, it's, typically, always, it's, it is what it is. And then we go from there. And so it's not really a problem to worry about, is this answer going to help my case or not? It's just answer truthfully and move on. Is that about right? That is it. Absolutely. There's no other way to do it. You only have one reputation as well. You know, there's, you might right. as well do the best job you can. You know what you're being paid to do, so do it. Before we wrap up, do you have any last advice for newer expert witnesses in particular or attorneys working with experts? First of all, I think you try to structure your time in your workflow, in your office. From the get-go, maybe because I came from a manufacturing background, I set up a job management system. Uh, that's partly because I actually developed a solar fabric device for the U.S. Army. As part of doing that, I had to have my accounting system basically comport with or be satisfactory to the U.S. government. And so I had to hire an accountant to come in and set up my accounting system which was basically a job-based accounting system. So what I do typically is if I have a case, I assign that case a job number. The outcome of that is I charge my time to that job, charge all expenses to that job, and all income is credited to that job. The benefit there is I know how much money is made. The profitability of each job is known at the end of the day. Then the filing system is based upon that same numbering sequence, that sit, that uh, system. And I have a database through which I enter all the time and the activities that I do, again, using that job numbering system. And the last thing I would say about it is go paperless if you can, <laughs> because it will make your life easier from a filing perspective. And that's it. Sage advice, Mr. Parent. Thank you so much for joining me here today. You're absolutely welcome. Thanks for the invitation. And thank you to our audience for joining me for another discussion at the Roundtable. Cheers. Thank you for listening to our podcast, Discussions at Roundtable. Our show notes are available on our website, roundtablegroup.com. Subscribe today on Apple Podcasts or your favorite listening apps. 